Good evening, everyone. Thanks so much for joining us for Facebook Live tonight, focused on kidney stones and men's health. We're joined with three of Mon Health's finest. We're here with Dr. David Hall, urologist here at Mon Health, Dr. John Batten, urologist here at Mon Health, and Dr. Shakiri Rad, who's a robotic surgeon and urologist, also here at Mon Health. Thanks so much for joining us. Thanks we appreciate it. It's good to all be together again. We haven't been together since, oh, was that pre-COVID or was it, I don't remember when we were, it was like last April. It's been a while. Yeah, yeah. it was a great show. Over, uh, yes, but COVID thanks for, so yes, it was. <laughs> but thanks for coming back. We appreciate it. And we had a lot of great questions then and I'm sure we will tonight. Sure. Um, so just getting started, we always like to do this. Can we hear who you are, what your specialty is? We know urology, but really what led you to Mon Health? Dr. Hall, do you want to start? Um, yeah, well, I'm a Morgantown native. Um, I uh, you know, grew up here my entire life. I uh, went away to college and came back and spent 10 years doing my uh, medical school and residency training here. Um, and then I joined a private group in 2001. And then I became a, hos a hospital employee here six years ago. Um, and uh, I've really always had an interest in medicine and urology gives a nice opportunity to combine different aspects of medicine. There's uh, part of it in the, in the OR, part of it in the clinic, uh, and there's always new technology in urology. And there's a lot of satisfaction in the patients that we treat. Um, a lot of times you're treating pain and you get a lot of satisfaction when we're leaving kidney stone pain. Uh, you treat a lot of patients with cancer and satisfaction with uh, helping them with that. And raised in Morgantown. Yes. <laughs> I'm originally from Western Pennsylvania and I trained at the University of Pittsburgh in medical school. Did my residency at WVU and my wife and I fell in love with Morgantown and I joined a private urologist here at Mon General about 22 years ago. Uh, Dr. Stowden, wonderful guy, I learned a lot off him. Uh, Dr. Hall was part of our group and uh, we, we just felt it was a great place to stay. Mon General was very uh, responsive to the doctor's uh, needs and the patient's needs above all. And so we decided to, to stay here. Um, my areas of, of interest are, uh, you know, kidney stones and uh, prostate care, BPH, prostate cancer. Um, and I, uh, I'm glad that we decided to spend our, my whole career here and I hope I can spend many more. And a lot of patients do. Dr. Rad. Yeah, so I traveled uh, you know, all over the world as a kid and uh, I ended up in Parkersburg, West Virginia uh, where I uh, finished high school and that's where I met my wife. Uh, we um, came to Morgantown for undergraduate studies, both of us, and uh, moved to uh, Lewisburg, Green Greenbrier County where I did my medical school. Uh, I went to Michigan for my training and when we wanted to uh, settle down, we really wanted to come back to West Virginia, provide this, uh, you know, services uh, that, that um, I had learned over there and apply them here locally to our community and um, it was just a great fit. I met Dr. Batman Hall and uh, uh, the hospital here is uh, very focused on, on patient care, community hospital. We really care for our patients and that was the kind of atmosphere I wanted to be part of. And um, it's been a um, great experience for the past three years and I look forward to many more years as well. Perfect. Thank you all. Awesome introductions. All right. So let's get started. First question really uh, pertains to all of you. I don't know if you all want to make a point for this question, but let's discuss kidney stones, right? So how do you prevent them? What causes them? And what are they made of? Who wants to start? Kidney stones are just uh, minerals that form in our bodies, uh, in our kidneys, um, from substances that are in our urine. And uh, most of the time they're very hard. And uh, if, uh, if they become large enough, they can obstruct our kidneys and cause lots of different disease states, um, injury to the kidney and infections. And we, uh, we, there's a bunch of categories of kidney stones. The most common one is something we call calcium oxalate, which is a very hard stone. That's the one people are most familiar with. And um, there's other stones such as uric acid, which are special stones that we you can't really visualize well on standard x-rays. We have to use special modalities like CAT scan and ultrasound. Um, there's uh, numerous causes. I'll let one of my colleagues speak if they'd like uh, about those. Yeah, okay. yeah, we, I mean, we can talk about different treatments for the stones. Um, mm. 
You know, typically, someone presents in the emergency room with severe renal colic, flank pain, and uh, the most common way of treating is conservative treatment. Uh, most people will be able to pass stones um, given enough time. Uh, so the key is to keep the pain under control and uh, some, sometimes use medications to help um, the stones move along. But when they don't pass, when they're, they're not uh, you know, doing what, they, what we want them to do, <laughs> Uh, there are different treatments. So one of the treatments is shockwave lithotripsy. This is a, a machine that we can put, it's minimally invasive, we put up against the back and send an ultrasonic wave into the stone to break it up into smaller pieces that people can pass. Another treatment is ureteroscopy where we go up with a small scope um, up the ureter, up to the stone and remove the stone or use a laser to break it up and take the pieces out. Um, there are a couple uh, more advanced treatments that we sometimes use. Um, I'll let uh, Dr. Shakuri Rad talk about those. Um. Sure, and, and, and so the, the treatment options as we progress and use uh, less and less invasive treatments, um, uh, they, they allow us essentially to treat any type of stone. Uh, some stones are small, like Dr. Hall mentioned, they can be treated with uh, really minimal invasive treatments like lithotripsy and, and uh, ureteroscopy where we go inside the urinary tract with small cameras. But if, if uh, we face a situation where there's a very large stone, uh, large stone burden perhaps, uh, someone uh, uh, didn't really have much pain for many years and they did just their entire kidney filled up with a the stone, then uh, we can use some more advanced technologies. We can use robotic surgery. We can do advanced uh, percutaneous treatments. These are treatments where we go th uh, through the skin directly into the kidney and then introduce small cameras to uh, help us break up the stone. Um, and, and so all of these modalities are available. And the nice thing about our services here at Mon Health is that we really offer anything that you can imagine uh, in terms of kidney stones. So if you have a kidney stone, we're going to be able to treat it uh, one way or another. And it all depends on location, size, and uh, uh, patient factors in terms of what we end up recommending. And I'm sure whenever you get patients who have kidney stones, they're probably scared. And they don't even realize how much treatment is available for them, I bet, till they come see you. Right. Yeah. What they should remember is that most of the stones will be passed without treatment mm -hmm. and we help them along the whole way. Our nursing staff, our, our assistants, everybody, our mid-levels in the office are all coached on the appropriate management of, of kidney stones to help, help you pass the stone the whole and be there for you the whole way. And then we use the, the procedures if we have to. That's great. Okay. All right. Perfect. Thank you. Um, next question we have. Which soda is worse for kidney stones, Coke or Sprite? Interesting. I'll, I'll take that since I, I think I know where that comes from. Okay. <laughs> uh, so I recently, uh, you know, kind of posed that question as well to to some patients to see if I, uh, you know, if, if if patients have done their okay. uh, due diligence and research. And so when we talk about kidney stones, one of the most common questions we always get is, why did I get one? Mm -hmm. And uh, it's, as, as Dr. Hall and Bad mentioned, it is usually a relative dehydration, state of dehydration, along with imbalance of the electrolytes that we filter through our kidney. And certain uh, foods and drinks can uh, exacerbate and uh, predispose you to these uh, kidney stones. Now, when we talk about Coke and Peps uh, and, and Sprite, uh, we talk about, uh, for example, something called phosphoric acid that's in Coke products. So it's essentially any drink that you can't see through that's carbonated most likely has phosphoric acid in it. And uh, drinks that you can see through, uh, such, such, such as Sprite, they have citric acid in it. And so those, are, those create an environment where uh, if you have the citric acid, you don't have as, uh, you know, you're not as predisposed to kidney stones as if uh, you have the phosphoric acid uh, in Coke. The additional thing is also that a lot of these sugary drinks have fructose in them. And fructose is one of the um, substances in our diet that can really increase risk of kidney stones. And there are many studies about that that really reinforce the reduction of fructose. And we hear about that for other disease states as well. Very interesting. All right. Thank you. Next question is, what can help keep you from forming kidney stones? What's the best way to steer away from them? Dr. Hall, you want to take that? Yeah, so the, I, I think Dr. Shakuri was talking mostly about, about the oxalate. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, hydration, Dr. Batten mentioned that. We typically recommend all of our patients drink about 100 ounces of water a day. This uh, keeps you hydrated. It uh, dilutes your urine. It's only when your urine gets concentrated that these crystals drop out of solution and form the stone. So that's the most important key is staying hydrated. Now, if you do have one of these calcium oxalate stones, um, besides avoiding Coke and Pepsi products, 
uh, beets, spinach, and rhubarb. Those three are very high in oxalate. We tell our patients to avoid those foods all the time. Uh, you want to moderate the amount of calcium you take in. You still need to take in calcium to keep your bones healthy, but don't be excessive with dairy. Um, and then a low salt and low protein diet also helps. Beets, noted. So in general, with you know, I tell my patients, water is your friend, salt's your enemy. You know, if you remember those two things that, you know, drink when you're out working, stay hydrated. If your urine becomes odorous, uh, malodorous and dark, it usually means that you're becoming dehydrated. You, not a UTI, that's just dehydration. You need to respond to that with the fluid intake. It's not one specific food, but it's everything collectively. And a little bit of everything is okay, but you want to make sure you have a lot of water and watch your salt. You know, it's hard to stay hydrated. You know, it's just you're so busy during the day, you don't even think to do it. And sometimes iced tea or Coke just <laughs> sounds so wonderful, but perfect tips. All right, next question we have. Um, if I think I have kidney stones, I think Dr. Hall, you may have brushed on this, but do you go straight to your primary care or just straight to a urologist? What should you do? Well, if you've had them before, you probably should be established with the urologist. You know, we get you in, we work you up, and hopefully keep you out of the emergency room. Um, if you've never had a kidney stone and you think that's what you have, it probably is best to see your family physician first because there are a lot of other things it could be. Um, and they'll make the appropriate referral. If the pain is severe, like, like it is usually with a kidney stone presentation, you're gonna be showing up in the emergency room to get your first you know, diagnosis. Okay, yep. Next question we have, can kidney stones cause infections? That's a great question, and uh, I'll, I'll take that. And kidney stones, a lot of uh, people think of them as uh, just annoying and, and painful perhaps even. Uh, but kidney stones can be lethal in cases, and uh, especially uh, when there's an uh, active urinary tract infection and uh, one of the kidney stone has obstructed the flow of urine from the kidney down into the bladder, the infection can accumulate and expand and actually enter the bloodstream. These can cause, uh, these infections can cause sepsis, and um, if, if we don't get to the patient uh, fast enough and decompress the kidney, it can be fatal. And so kidney stones, uh, uh, you know, can, can uh, range from anywhere between asymptomatic all the way through uh, sepsis and ICU admissions and, and beyond. And so it's very important uh, for someone who has a history of them, as Dr. Hall mentioned, to stay with a urologist that can really guide them. And if uh, someone thinks to have a kidney stone and along with that has uh, fevers or signs of infection, they should go to an emergency room for immediate uh, uh, workup. Okay, thank you. Next question. What if I see blood in my urine? What does that mean? Well, that obviously, you should only under very few circumstances should you see blood in your urine. Um, that could mean something serious is wrong with your urinary tract, or some, uh, you know, some other reason. But, but that's something you need to let your doctor know about. Um, whether you have pain or not, if you're urinating blood when you shouldn't be, um, um, there's a, it could be a kidney stone like we're discussing, but it could be something more serious, like a polyp or tumors that could turn to cancer. And so, uh, you know, you can't just assume it's a kidney stone. If you get side pain and you've never been diagnosed with kidney stones, you know, it could be something else more, more serious than a kidney stone. So that's why you need to contact your doctor and, and be evaluated. Okay, thank you. Next question, are kidney stones genetic? Well, we you do see it running in families. Um, so we, we, there are a lot of people that have you know, genetic predisposition to stones. Um, we, we think that there are factors in the urine that inhibit stone formation, because it's amazing we don't all form kidney stones if you look at what's in our urine. And so it makes sense to think that some people don't have those same factors. There's a mutation that's being passed down from one generation to the next, and that's why they more likely form stones. But you can still uh, prevent stones with the things we talked about, mainly hydration. This is an interesting question. Can men get UTIs? You really only hear about it in women. So I don't know if that's something you see often or let's take Absolutely. that. Absolutely. So uh, UTIs can occur in both men and women, although they are more frequent in, in uh, females. Mm -hmm. uh, if a UTI occurs in a man, by definition, it's considered a complicated UTI. So we say, why did it happen? And we try to investigate it. Now, if it's a uh, you know, one-time thing and we treat it and it goes away, doesn't happen again, we may not uh, 
um, uh, do any kind of invasive testing on, on a man. But if it uh, definitely happens more than once or becomes more of a frequent picture, we uh, evaluate them. Uh, we uh, may have to look inside their bladders with a small camera called the cystoscopy. We may have to get some imaging like ultrasound or x-rays or CT scans. And uh, sometimes we find um, uh, underlying cause. Uh, it may re be related uh, to uh, other s uh, sources. It may be related to prostatitis, inflammation or infection in the prostate. It may be related to kidney stones. Kidney stones can actually uh, harbor infection and infections can cause kidney stones as well. There are certain kidney stones that are related to specific uh, bacteria. And so uh, it's definitely not a, um, uh, UTIs are not uh, uh, in, in one uh, gender or the other. They definitely can occur in both. And uh, they are very important, um, especially in, in patients uh, who have a history of uh, kidney stones and, and should be evaluated. Gotcha. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Next question. Who should be tested for prostate cancer? Well, there's a couple different groups who make recommendations. As far as your, from our, the American Urologic Association, um, we, uh, you know, in, generally, in general, we recommend middle-aged men, perhaps 50 to 55, to start getting the prostates checked and discuss having a PSA with them, uh, which is a, a, a blood test. A PSA is a blood test that we get that, that, that can tell us if you're at risk for prostate cancer. And um, not everybody needs to have it every year. Um, but uh, it's particularly if, it, if it's in your family, your father, your brothers, uncles had it, um, you may even start getting your prostate checked in your 40s and start getting um, a blood, blood tests earlier. But um, mid, middle aged men are at highest risk and, and um, need to start getting checked for that. What are some signs and symptoms of prostate cancer? What should I look out for? So prostate cancer is considered a silent cancer in, in most uh, men. Uh, in the past, uh, before perhaps the 80s, before we had the PSA blood test available, prostate cancer would be diagnosed at late stages often, where patients would come in with pains and uh, bony aches and imaging or uh, other exams would uh, demonstrate metastatic prostate cancer. Now, uh, in the 80s and, and uh, later, we uh, started being more aggressive with a screening, and that screening led to a, a, a approximately 50% reduction in prostate cancer mortality. Despite that, prostate cancer remains the number two cause of death in men, uh, cancer-related death uh, in men, and it's also the, most, uh, the second most common cause of cancer in general uh, in men. And so um, this is very prevalent. Um, it uh, uh, definitely should be screened for, just like we screen patients with colonoscopy starting at age 50. Uh, PSA is simply a blood test. And the interpretation of that test uh, can really be done by a urologist uh, uh, that, that can guide the patient through uh, the, the not just the number that we get, but also s additional factors that we take into consideration, such as family history, genetic factors, otherwise, and uh, we have some additional tools available to really guide the patient and make recommendations. Gotcha. Okay. Thank you. Um, next question. Uh, what about testosterone testing? Is that something that I should do? Dr. Hall? Well, um, <laughs> there's a lot of controversy with testosterone um, replacement because uh, we don't know, uh, you know whether this is going to cause cardiovascular effects. Uh, there have been some studies that showed you know, increased strokes, increased heart attacks with testosterone replacement. So you, you don't want to just be re taking testosterone. So if you truly do have a reason to have low testosterone, someone may have had radiation or chemotherapy or lost a testicle, and they truly do have you know, a need for testosterone, at that point you're doing testosterone replacement therapy. You're simply replacing what was there. You're not supplementing the natural aging uh, decline in testosterone, which occurs. Okay, thank you. In terms of what you might have. What symptoms you might have. Um, with extremely low testosterone, you could even have hot flashes, but uh, most people it's gonna be low energy, but who doesn't have low energy? <laughs> and um, and uh, you could have you know, lo you know, loss of uh, uh, bone mass, or muscle mass rather, uh, feeling weaker. Um, those are the kind of things. Um, next question we have, why do I feel the urge to urinate more frequently? So 
Yeah. That's, a, that's a loaded question, mm -hmm. uh, if, if you will. And so I think all of us could go in various directions with that. And, uh, and, and urinary urgency is uh, one of the symptoms that may bring a patient to our office, whether it, it, it's a, a male or female, uh, it can be an underlying uh, um, uh, problem such as overactive bladder, it may be even as uh, much as uh, bladder cancer causing those symptoms. And so the, it's a broad spectrum and urinary urgency, um, uh, you know, if it's bothersome to the point that it's affecting quality of life especially, can be evaluated in our office and we would have to really know a lot more about the patient to see which category they best fit into and, do, and, and uh, where we need to take him to get him some relief. Yeah, in general, you don't want to be overreactive. If you have a day or two or a week that you're urinating more frequently, um, certain foods and fluids that we take in can irritate the bladder. Uh, some people respond to stress with urgency and frequency. Um, and you know, it might be just something transient, but if it stays and it progresses, then you need to get your urine checked and perhaps more be done. You start with your primary care doctor and they will make the appropriate referral if necessary. Thank you. Next question. Why does it take so long to urinate? Um, so the most common thing we see in men is prostate enlargement as, as the reason. Um, it's not always the reason. And I, like Dr. Batten was mentioning, if it's just a transient thing, I wouldn't, wouldn't worry about it. But if it's constant, um, typically it's a weaker stream. Um, it's consistently weak and uh, it does take you longer. Um, this can result in getting up more at night, a uh, sensation of incomplete emptying, um, a lot of other symptoms, but that's common. Okay, perfect. Next question is, why do you do what you do? That's interesting, <laughs> yeah. Who wants me, to start? It's, it's an easy question. I, I grew up with uh, needing a urologist and uh, I was exposed very early on to urology, and then it just so happened my father-in-law was a urologist, and uh, I got to be exposed to a lot of it early on in life. And when I went to medical school, like Dr. Hall said earlier, it's the, the amount of tools available to a urologist, whether it's from large surgeries all the way down to small scopes, and you get to build up long-term relationships with patients, most of our problems are solvable, um, you know, with, with some effort, and um, it, it's just a, a pleasure. I, I love doing urology. Uh, my retirement plan now is not to retire because I really do enjoy what I do, and I think these guys would agree. Absolutely, and, and I think Dr. Hall kind of um, hit, hit it on the uh, on the head with uh, saying that you know urology has always been at the forefront of medical technology. And one of my interests was uh, uh, building robots as a kid. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, as a nerdy kid, I was building robots competing in competitions. And when I entered, uh, you know, got into medicine, I looked for that uh, te technological aspect. And robotic surgery was really uh, pioneered in the field of urology. And so that's what got me interested. And we can do some amazing things for our patients. And, uh, and, and like Dr. Batten and Hall mentioned, we can. Uh, do a, a broad, we, we can have a broad, broad, broad uh, uh, scope of practice. We can do anything from kidney stones to cancer to UTIs and, and all, all the different disease states in between. So it's really a pleasure t uh, taking care of all these patients that, that, that are in uh, big need uh, of urologists. That's great. Dr. Hall. Um, well, I mentioned at the beginning with my introduction you know, why I got into it. Um, I grew up here, my father's a physician, and um, you know, I always knew I wanted to be a doctor. Didn't know specifically about urology until medical school. And it's just through rotating through different services, uh, actually seeing Dr. Batten <laughs> uh, while I was a medical student, he was a resident. Uh, that, that got me into, interested in it. I never heard that yeah. before. <laughs> That's interesting. Thank you, Dr. Um, next question. Can the vasectomy be reversed and why would it be? Good question. Well, it, it, can, yeah, it can be reversed. Um, of, uh, core, you know, when we do a vasectomy, we're disconnecting the vas deferens so that sperm doesn't enter the ejaculate, and that makes men s sterile uh, who want to be sterile. But we can remove that blockage with a delicate surgery done under a microscope where we can sew the tubes back together, and it can be reversed. And I think it's 
usually in um, you know uh, in people that may be married to a different spouse who didn't have any children to that that couple didn't have any children together and they want to have children together um, that's probably one of the biggest reasons that we reverse it and um, we have a very good success rate here at Mon General um, but that's that would be the main reason I think it's important for men uh, to realize because we get this question in the office all the time is uh, if, if a man or a couple decide on uh, vasectomy as a permanent birth control solution for them uh, that they don't uh, come in with that expectation that hey you can reverse it any time and I, I can uh, have a successful pregnancy. Our reversal success is very high uh, as Dr. Bat mentioned but successful pregnancies uh, may not occur all the time so if someone decides on a vasectomy they should really have a discussion with their spouse and really be set on um, uh, permanent birth control through that method. All right, thank you. And on that note, happy early Father's Day. I know it's thank coming you. up no, this weekend, you. so happy Father's Day to all of you. And thank you so much. I mean, a wonderful group of questions tonight, and you guys did wonderfully. Thank you so much. We appreciate you. Thank Thanks you. so much for joining us tonight for Kidney Stones and Men's Health. Hopefully we have them all back again, and we appreciate your questions tonight. Have a great evening.